Our gospel lesson for this morning comes to us from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, verses 21 through 28. Listen to God's word. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teachings, for Jesus taught as one having authority and not as one of the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him, and crying out with a loud voice, came out of the man. They were all amazed and kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority? Jesus commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And so at once, Jesus' fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we cry out to you today, aware that we are in need of your grace. Draw near to us now. Cleanse us of our affliction. Open our minds and our eyes and our hearts and our hands to you to your work, to your grace, to your presence with us now. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts may be acceptable to you, O God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So if my memory serves me correctly, it was January of 2009, and the Steelers were in the playoffs. They were trying to get their spot in the Super Bowl, and so, like most Pittsburghers, my family was gathered at my sister's home, eating pizza and snacks, our eyes glued to the game. Now, as we watched the game, we had to do some calculations to think about the best way to get home. Our journey would take us through the south side, and as the Steelers continued to score more and more touchdowns, we knew that there might be some revelry taking place in the streets. So my husband and I decided to leave before the game was finished. So calculating our optimism with our need to get up and work early the next day, we had to give our drive home some special consideration. See, you might not have known this, but when I twirled my terrible towel at just the right time, usually when the other team had gotten the ball, the Steelers got the ball back and scored. And so, as we listened to the radio on our way home, my husband drove so that I could twirl the terrible towel at the right time. It was crucial that I would do my part to help secure the Steelers a place in the Super Bowl. We have all done this, haven't we? See, to most Steeler fans, this makes sense. This is what we do on game day. We have our snacks, we eat our pizza, we wear our black and gold, we twirl our terrible towel, we do our part to get the players to win. But honestly, I still giggle as I think about that night because the truth is that I am one of those people that call the cable company to see how I can get rid of my sports channels because they're adding costs to my bill and I'm just not using them. I know that there are touchdowns and field goals that go into earning points in a football game, but every time I watch a game, I need to have someone who is patient enough to tell me the mechanics of gameplay so that I know what's happening on the field and when to cheer. And frankly, this happens just about as often as the Steelers make it to the playoffs. 
So when I think back to that cold January night, I wonder what came over me. Maybe it was pride in my city. I am Pittsburgh born and bred. Maybe it was the contagious energy of collective hope. It's fun to be part of something bigger than ourselves. Maybe I just wanted something to cheer about because we all need something to get excited about, to bring us joy. We need something that's going to be fun. Maybe I just wanted to belong. Now, I don't know for sure, but at least for that evening, I was captivated by the Steelers. My spirit was theirs. I was all in. So I share this funny story to ask this question of you. What is it that captivates your spirit? It's a question that we don't think of very often. We live in a culture that demands that we are connected to multiple devices, that we are constantly multitasking, while also nudging us to assert that we have full command of our spirits. We like to believe that we have mastery over all that captures our attention, our affection, our energy, and our time. If only we could set enough reminders on our phone or sync our calendars or use the right mindfulness app before bed, or even if we could just trust in our own inherent goodness, we could rest easy and know that we have power over our spirits. But let's face it, there are things in this world that take hold of us. We go with the crowd's interpretation of events because we don't have time to look up the facts for ourselves. We cheer for things like performers or teams or even candidates because we desperately want to belong, to align our affiliation with others, and because sometimes it's fun. We stick with the status quo because it upholds our own comforts and we don't want to do the hard work of noticing that we're complicit in manifesting things like racism and sexism and homophobia because sometimes we're scared that if we name these things, we might lose our own security if we take a stand. So on a day that is not a Steelers playoff day, I like to think that my spirit is captivated by love. Now, my son told me yesterday to mention in my sermon today that I love him and that I love my husband. Now, I'm happy to say it. This is true. I do love them both. And as much, and so much of my attention, my efforts, my worries, my energy, my hopes, include my husband and our son, their well-being, the hopes and future of our family. Now, on a good day, love extends beyond our front door. Love might captivate my spirit, Love for our larger family or our friends. Love for neighbors who are known to me and those who I will never meet. Love for our God. And if it's a really, really good day, my spirit might be captivated even by a love for my enemy. But honestly, that's not the whole story. My spirit is easily captivated by irritation or self-righteousness. It is easily captivated my, by my own hungry belly or tired eyes. My spirit is captivated by the ease of an Amazon delivery, the dopamine rush of hitting checkout. My spirit is captivated by my own anxiety of the world around us. My own spirit is captivated by a desire to seem like I have it more together than I really do. My spirit, my attention, my efforts are captivated by what I think is fair, true, or worth taking a stand for. But if I tell the whole truth, my sense of fairness and truth 
and worthiness is often centered around me. Friends, what captivates your spirit? In today's gospel, we read that Jesus healed a man with an unclean spirit. Now, we don't know much about this spirit or the source of this man's affliction. In spite of many modern efforts to diagnose this man crying out in the temple, but we know a few things. We know that his spirit had been captivated by something unclean, whether it was a demon or an addiction or a sin or a broken heart. Something stood in the way of this man being in full communion with God, being in full communion with the worshiping community at the temple, and even being in full communion with the person God was calling him to be. Second, we know that this man and his unclean spirit were still in the synagogue even though they were unclean. They showed up in the Sabbath, a house of prayer, although we are left to wonder why. And finally, in a surprising twist, we see that the spirit alone recognized Jesus for who he was, naming Jesus the Holy One of God. In many ways, the story sounds like typical Jesus. He shows up in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Check. He heals a person from their affliction. Check. He amazes everyone who witnesses his power in action. Check again. Mark, well, he tells it like it is, not mincing words. And in just eight verses, we read the first recorded miracle of Jesus. But let's not let Mark's brevity distract us from all that's going on in this passage and all that Mark is trying to tell us. See, Mark does not include stories in his gospel just on a whim. In fact, he does not even include a story of the birth of Jesus. Rather, Mark intentionally picks what he finds to be most important so that the narrative he weaves together in this oldest gospel creates a portrait of Jesus as the one who came to save. And as a true work of art, Mark lays out for us in this first chapter just who Jesus is. The brush strokes of each brief vignette help us see Jesus. First, as the one about whom John the Baptist foretells. The one with more power and authority than John. The one whose sandals John is unfit to tie. We hear too in Mark that Jesus is God's own beloved child named and claimed by God and anointed by God's own spirit during his baptism as he emerges from the waters of the Jordan. Jesus, we hear as he calls the disciples, is the one worth following whose invitation compelled lifelong fishermen to drop their nets in an instant. Then here, in the synagogue, we hear that Jesus is the one who has the power to break the hold of an unclean spirit. He alone can set this man free. Mark wants us to see in no uncertain terms that Jesus possesses the authority of God. What has captivated Christ's spirit? Nothing less than God's own Holy Spirit. Jesus acts with the authority of God, with the heart of God, with the direction of the Spirit of God. Mark wants it to be clear. God is with us in Christ. And so Mark wants us and all who hear and read to pay attention to the one whose authority who is, wor is worth noticing who alone has the authority to right wrongs, enact authentic justice, and change our lives. <sighs> but how? See, we have likely gathered for worship today because we believe in God. 
We think, or at least we hope, that Jesus can make a difference in our lives and in our world today. But like those who gathered in the temple those years ago, we wonder, how can Christ's power and authority claim its hold on our lives and our world today? How can Jesus drive out all that distracts us? How can Jesus claim the attention of our spirits in a way that will bring lasting change to our world? Our own sacred rituals seldom include exorcisms. And as Pastor Randy pointed out, we cannot even gather here for the laying on of hands or to receive a morsel of bread held out in the sacrament. See, we know we need God's power more than ever, but how will God's power be displayed when we're hunkered down indoors in a cold winter, when there's no gathering at the temple itself, when we wonder where in the world can we see Jesus? Now see, if we look at what Mark tells us about the man with this unclean spirit, and Jesus responds to him, we can find a few clues from the text. See, first, we can simply name what captivates our spirits. We can acknowledge that we are swept away by our social media feeds, that we are quick to avoid a conversation that calls out and makes us uncomfortable. We can confess our desire to be first, to be first in line, to be first to make that Pittsburgh left turn at the traffic light, to be the first to be heard. We can pay attention to how we spend our time and how we spend our money. We can examine whether our words align with our actions. Do we do what we say we believe? We can acknowledge what Thomas Merton so eloquently states when he says, every moment of my own natural appetite, even though my nature is good in itself, tends in one way or another to keep alive in me the illusion that is opposed to God's reality living within me. He says, if my love does not reach out toward God but scatters itself in God's creation, it is because I have reduced God's life in me to a level of formality, forbidding it to move in me with a truly vital influence. Friends, in order for God's power to be a vital influence in our lives and in our worlds, we must first acknowledge our need for God's grace. We must acknowledge that, in, that our spirits, too, are in need of a makeover. We can tell the truth. We confess our sins. We can name our need to be captivated by God's spirit and redirected to God's presence over and over again. And then we can show up. We can participate in community. We can show up in hope over Zoom, or signing petitions in a turnaround, or simply entering into prayer with and for one another. Because we need community to hold us accountable. We can admit that we can't go this road alone. It's too hard and distorted and convoluted. And so by stepping into relationship with one another and with God in the temple, over Zoom, with masks on at a safe distance, Christ can show up for us. And we can pay attention. We can slow ourselves down and enter into prayer, even if our prayer sounds like inappropriate cries to God that makes everyone around us a little bit uncomfortable. We can practice listening, noticing the saving God in our midst so that our spirits might line up with the Spirit of God in our midst. And then we can trust that God, who is gracious, will do the rest. 
but we have to give up the illusion that we can do this all ourselves. We need to somehow nurture in our spirits a spirit of humility, a willingness to name our imperfection and our need, to admit that sin clouds our view and captures our heart even as we try to be our best selves. We need to admit that we don't have it all figured out as individuals or as a church and certainly not as a world. Reverend Nadia Boltz Weber, a pastor and author, tells a story of the day she learned that George Zimmerman had been acquitted of murdering Trayvon Martin. She tells of how hearing this verdict mirrored to her not only her outrage at injustice, but also her own inner ambiguity, her inconsistent standards, her privilege, her sin. She says this, there is both violence and nonviolence in me, and yet I don't believe in them both. So at the suggestion of a member of her congregation, she did this. She goes on to write, I admitted to my congregation that I had to look at how my outrage feels good for a while, but only like eating candy corn feels good for a while. I know it's nothing more than empty calories. My outrage feels empty because what I'm desperate for is to speak the truth of my burden of sin and have Jesus take it from me. Yet ranting about the system or about other people will always be my go-to instead. Because maybe if I show up with the right level of outrage, it will make up for the fact that every single day of my life I have benefited from the very same system that acquitted George Zimmerman. My opinions feel good until I crash from the self-righteous sugar high. Then I realize I'm still sick and hungry for a taste of mercy. Siblings, what captivates your spirits? As we gather to worship this day, the truth is that we are not really much different than the man crying out in the temple who knows he is in need of grace. Our spirits, too, are captivated by sin and outrage, by false identities and lies we have believed. Our spirits have been captivated by systems that distort worldly power. And we have either feasted off of its benefits or been told that we don't count much at all. Friends, our spirits have been captivated by so much that turns us away from the Spirit of God in our midst. And so we show up today not because we have things all figured out, I sure don't, but because we need to be here. We need the anointing of the one who can set us free, free to be ourselves, free to be the body of Christ, the church at work in the world free from all that oppresses or harms or distorts God's vision for this world. We need mercy. We need the mercy offered to us in Christ. Thankfully, Mark makes it clear. The God we show up to worship is a God who saves. Jesus greets us where we are, in the midst of our imperfection and our lack of cleanliness, in the midst of our distorted worldly views, our exhaustion, the systems that misdirect us and hold us back. See, Jesus meets us here with the power to heal us, the power to forgive us, and with the power even to set us free. Let us greet this Christ who is calling out 
to us. May it be so. Amen.